comment and build on it, but also uh, I will start with your presentation. So Patricia is Associate Professor at the Department of Social, Political and Cognitive Science in the uh, University of Siena. And she is also visiting professor at the Department of Industrial Design, Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, she is also director uh, of and delegate uh, and director of Santa Chiara Fab Lab. So she is uh, both, uh, let's say, theoretical and practical. And also, I think uh, the the um, the title of the speech that she was preparing in the last days, but that unfortunately we cannot see in a full. But maybe we will enjoy also the the the, the best pinpoint of this is uh, the many facets of UX. So is the idea that uh, we can practice UX not only in digital but mainly in physical. And also we had the opportunity to discuss with Mark about the voice interaction and the vehicle interaction and so on. So I think these two um, talks are really connected in terms of uh, 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 let's say aiming and meaning. So Patricia. I will leave you the floor. Uh, I'm really sorry about the technical issue. And uh, if you want to prompt in some project, I, I'm ready with my YouTube to set the video and uh, share with the, the students. And for sure, this is a promise. You need to come back <laughs> to have the full lesson uh, inside our, uh, let's say, in class. So this is another appointment, maybe, maybe in presence, if we can, in the next future. I don't know when. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and um, uh, I, I really want to say that I'm delighted and honored to, uh, to give this talk uh, for two main reasons. The first one is that uh, the organizers are really esteemed colleagues uh, in the field of uh, psychology and design. And, and they are also good friends, so it's always a pleasure for me. But the second reason is that it is really time to, uh, to put together different disciplines that play uh, a so much important role uh, with, uh, within the, 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 the user experience design area. Uh, I remember I visited uh, uh, several years ago now it was I think the first time was 1992 uh, I visited Don Norman in in San Diego and uh, you know is uh, the guru of the discipline the father of uh, the experience design uh, among other things human-centered design and um, uh, when I was there it started uh, I founded the cognitive science department with the idea that cognitive science and psychology uh, could support, could provide support to the design of new technologies. Uh, and this was really a powerful idea, um, but uh, it was it was difficult to to put it in practice uh, because. Um, it's quite rare to have um, interdisciplinary uh, courses available. And uh, the idea of this master is really, um, is really something uh, new. Uh, it's the time for having this kind of studies. Um, so I, I really congratulate with the, with the organizers because this is uh, this is what, what we really need, and I, um, I I hope that in the future we could also bring together other disciplines, together with psychology and design, maybe uh, engineer uh, engineering and computer science, uh, among other disciplines. Because, uh, as Don Norman says, um, experience is everything. Experience is everywhere. And sometimes, at least the first time I heard this, I thought, wow, this is scary. So where do we start from? Where, what can we do if, if this is everywhere? This is everything. But I think what we really have to, uh, to keep in mind is the human centeredness. This is what we need to do. Uh, this is that people should be really at the forefront 
of our effort when we design for experience. Because experience design is not just about designing um, interfaces. And uh, the, 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 these two, the UI and the, the, the UX, are um, often um, confused. But this is not the case. So wh when I um, when I prepare this talk about uh, uh, the um, the title, the many facets of UX, of course, in 30 minutes, um, you, you cannot say which are all the facets of uh, UX. Uh, you, you you saw uh, uh, quite a lot from Mark. Um, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't follow all the, all the talk because I was struggling with, uh, uh, with Google Chrome. Uh, but, uh, at least I wanted to give you an idea of two, uh, kind, two facets of UX. The first one that is much more related to, um, perceptual sensory motor perceptions that we that we can have with different kind of artifacts and the second is about aesthetics uh, i i saw that you are quite interested in this uh, in this topic uh, also the questions to mark were quite uh, clear about that uh, so ux from a social cultural point of view ux uh, about, uh, um, you know, related to aesthetics and self-expression um, and playfulness, for example. So there are really many different facets. And uh, the first, the first reflection that I wanted to share with you and is about, uh, uh, you know, the message that UX is not UI, is not user, just user interface is that when we touch a touch screen like this uh, uh, only a very small part of our uh, senses are involved so what do we touch when we touch a touch screen hmm? uh, we touch very flat surfaces uh, we slide with manipulate but we don't have any perception of the inherent properties of these digital ob objects. So we don't feel the weight, we don't feel the friction, we don't feel the shapes, the forms, uh, we don't feel the textures. And uh, our senses are only slightly involved in this kind of interaction. And this is, and this is quite important because, uh, you know, in the real life, uh, the way in which we touch objects express already a lot of meaning. First of all, express an intention. Uh, think about when you need uh, to use an app from your, uh, from your smartphone. And then you are in a hurry. Maybe you want to take a picture of something that is moving. So you really need to have the service ready for you so that you can take the picture. And so the kind of gesture that you do with your telephone are different than the ones that you would do if you are very relaxed. For example, you can wait for the system to process your input and then you can use the service. Well, the way in which you interact with your smartphone is not understood by the system. So the system doesn't understand our intention to do something, our way of expressing an urgency, for example, or the importance of doing something. There is no way of saying this. There is no expression. Hmm? Our um, our um, actions are not really expressive. We just, you know, our body is conceived just like an executor of actions, and this is a, and this is a limitation, of course. So, um, talking about the many facets of UX, I think that the first part of the story that we have to consider is that experience is about expression. Uh, 
that should be reflected both in action and reaction. So let me do another example. If you squeeze a lemon, hmm, the fact that you squeeze is extremely expressive because the action and the reaction from the lemon, they are coupled. So you see proximity, you see speed, you see acceleration, you see the amount of force that you put in squeezing. And this is continuity in interaction. And it's extremely expressive. But when you interact with a, uh, you know, any kind of digital device, you input a command and then you have to wait. There is no continuity in interaction. And continuity is everywhere. It's everywhere when you touch something that is soft, then you have a continuity in interaction. And you can understand how the person tried to express an intention to do something just looking at the way in which he or she interact with this object. So um, this kind of concept, um, uh, you know, I researched a lot about that. And let me uh, tell you the story of a, of a project, uh, um, a European funded project that is called a company. I don't know if Venanzio wants to browse this. Um, uh, the project was about, uh, uh, is about, um, is, uh, is on robotics. And, and the objective of this project was to facilitate independent living at el of elderly people at home. And um, the, 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 coordinator of this uh, of this project uh, that was the that was the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany invited me to to join the consortium because they had this uh, robot that is called Venanzio if you can show a picture care robot uh, number 3 the version 3 uh, this is a very very big robot very big. I, I have the video already, Patricia. Can I can I share the video while you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can share the video while I, I I explain the situation. And this is exactly one of the the lady uh, that we involved um, in our uh, in our uh, experiment. But the point here was that uh, they had uh, the robot and they said. Well, it is not very well accepted by older people. So how can we create an empathic relation or a good experience with this kind of robot? And this was the challenge. And, um, and so I said, okay, <laughs> let's try. But it was clear that we couldn't do anything in relation to the, uh, to the robot itself. Uh, because the robot was there, so the aesthetic was there, the, the form was there, the main uh, movements were there. So what we could do to create an empathic relation with this big robot. And so what we did during this three-year project was to develop um, uh, a, a service. This is the interface that you can see. Um, this is a context dependent um, interface. So through this interface, you can see what the robot can do uh, for you in a certain moment. So for example, if uh, just to, 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 to show you, uh, uh, to mention a, a scenario. So if for example, the person didn't drink for a few hours, um, the action possibility that popped up on that uh, interface were bring me the water. So it was uh, a, a way for the, uh, for the robot to suggest to the person something that was good for her in that moment. And it was uh, extremely fluid. Of course, uh, this system was very complex. Uh, there were a lot of technologies around the uh, full domotic um, system in the, in the house. Um, but uh, the, the, the interface 
was designed not only uh, at the level of user interface, but also the cover of uh, the tablet was a squeezable cover so that the person could squeeze uh, the tablet to say, come here. And the way in which she squeezed the, ta the, the, the tablet uh, was to express an urgent, an urgency for, um, for the action. So come here very quickly or come here, tell me what I, what you can do for me. Huh? And the other point was that the interface was designed in a way uh, to give the impression to the person to see the world through the eyes of the robot. So there was a kind of mask um, where the, the, the lady could see the world around through the, the, the eyes of the robot. So as she could share uh, the same kind of view. Mm? This is something that is called perspective taking, is, uh, is a social behavior, as Mark said, this is so important. If you share the difficulties, so for example, if she asked for an action that uh, the robot couldn't do for any kind of reason because there was an obstacle, because the, the carpet was too high to be, uh, uh, to, to, to walk through or to walk around, uh, so if there was any kind of difficulty, the person could share this and maybe could ask something different or simply uh, it was easier to be patient and to wait uh, so that the, the robot could do something. So there were so many different, uh, very, very small ways of creating this empathy um and also it was not just at the level as, as i said of the user interface but also we took into account this uh, the sensory motor abilities of of the the the, the older people that we involved in this uh, in this design and everything was designed with them so with workshop for where they had to do a lot of Things. We had a lot of fun with uh, these elderly people. Um, uh, you know, also squeezing was very fun if, uh, for them because some of them didn't have force enough to squeeze. Our first prototype was uh, was quite funny to see. But um, this can give you the idea that. Uh, the continuity in interaction, the possibility to express an intention to do something or the intention that, or the fact that there are possibilities around of interaction and the meaning emerges in interaction is not given from the beginning. It's something that you build. It's a kind of relationship that you have with the system you are interacting with. Um, this was the, the first uh, um, uh, case case that I um, uh, selected for this talk. The second one is about uh, other facets of UX, and and this is a, a, an ongoing project. Uh, uh, again, this is some, a project that was uh, um, funded by the the, the European Union. Uh, in a very, very interesting program that is called Wear Sustain. Uh, it's about uh, designing wearables of the future uh, in multidisciplinary teams with the psychologists, artists, designers, engineers. So this is very close to what you are going to do uh, in, in this master. And the facets here that uh, I would like to show with you are related to aesthetics, culture, self-expression, gender-related issues, and playfulness. So it's quiet to the right? Yes, this is quietude. And uh, uh, I will ask you in a while 
to go through the, the link that I've just sent to you. Uh, take this uh, in, in your browser and, uh, and, and, and go to the other one. But le let me say something uh, here uh, before. Um, so our project started with uh, um, a reflection uh, about clothing and accessorizing the, uh, the body. Um, of course, we all know that clothing and accessor and clo clothing and accessories perform a very important physical, social, psychological function. Uh, they provide uh, protection, concealment. Uh, they support communication, uh, self-expression, a status or affiliation. So they communicate a lot. And the fashion designers are very well aware about all these functions of clothing. But all these meanings uh, of clothing and uh, accessories uh, are completely lost when you talk about other wearables. Uh, I am referring to assistive devices. Assistive devices are continue to be highly stigmatizing. Uh, they have all a magical looking, they have a very poor aesthetics, they have no gendered body design. They are quite boring, let's say. And they are usually framed in terms of solving a problem, solving a lack, compensating a lack. So, it is clear in the way in which they are, they are designed that um, they, um, the intention is to compensate something that is lacking, hmm? to compensate an impairment. As if all the other characteristics of the person are completely lost. Hmm? The only um, um, uh, medical eye that evolved in the history um, from a medical device to fashion accessories are the, the glasses. The glasses are used by everyone. We also use sunglasses and no one would say that you are disabled because you wear glasses. Um, and, but this is the only example. The other kind of uh, medical eyes uh, all have the same kind of issue. So they are boring, they are stigmatizing. They, it seems that they are designed without, without thinking about people. So going back to this project, uh, the project is called Quietude, uh, and is uh, related to uh, deaf people. Hmm? Uh, deafness is an invisible kind of disability. Uh, and deaf people, this is a way of looking at user experience from a cultural point of view. Uh, deaf people don't define themselves as uh, disabled. For example, they don't participate to the Paralympic Games because they don't feel to be disabled. Uh, within their community, they are not disabled at all. If we all would uh, would uh, speak, would, would use the sign language, they wouldn't be disabled. So they are made disabled by the environment, the social cultural environment. But still, I mean, uh, also uh, the words that we use, we use uh, deaf and dumb. We use the uh, has as we think about this impairment as a lack, hmm? the impossibility to hear in something. So uh, we, we address this problem. The, the, the project is called Quietude. Um, we will go to, the, to the, the website in a while, but just to give you some numbers, around 466 million people worldwide have a disability hearing impairment, and it is estimated that in uh, uh, 2050, over 900 million people will have a disabling hearing loss. 
So it's a quite severe problem, and the current solutions mainly, mainly are the hearing aids and implants. And they both uh, present a lot of problems with respect to the user experience because the acceptance is extremely low, the aesthetics is extremely low, you may be uh, uh, remember all the adv uh, advertisements that we see every day. So when um, there are the hearing aids uh, that are advertised and they should be extremely tiny, they should be invisible. So the only paradigm that is used in the design of this kind of devices is invisibility. So we should hide uh, this kind of impairment just to avoid the stigma. So people have to hide their impairment. And I think this is something that we should think about. Um, and we started from this reflection to, um, uh, to think about the uh, deafness as a as an opportunity for design, something completely different. And our challenge was to change this stigma into something that was desirable. So if um, uh, Venancio can uh, start the, the, the video that uh, uh, that is uh, available here, exactly this one, uh, you can see here uh, a workshop that we did one of the uh, the many workshops that we did with deaf people at our fab lab uh, they were involved in designing future hearing aids um, you can see that uh, we try to inspire them with trying different materials um, and uh, to we try to address really their experience of uh, not hearing. So they designed this body map. They put the feelings on the body to see where, um, how they felt about uh, uh, deafness. We tried this uh, tiny uh, vibrate, vibrator motors uh, to see where they, they were more uh, sensible to, um, to vibration. And then we started prototyping jewelries. Uh, jewelries for deaf people, jewels that can detect sounds of interest. So, for example, if uh, I was deaf, uh, someone calling me on my doorbell, my dog, an alarm, um, and we started prototyping. In the, uh, you, you could see a deaf student, and she designed this very nice uh, stuff. Um, uh, with antennas uh, that move when there is sound around to show that she's deaf because invisibility is a problem because as soon as people start talking quickly or if they don't give um, if if they are turned around or if there is that uh, if the, the the environment around is noisy then the disability is, is made very, very visible. So they, they want to, uh, to, uh, to show uh, that they have some kind of difficulty in the situation. So the kind of uh, jewelry that we designed are able to detect sound of interest and to notify these uh, the, sounds uh, through vibrations uh, through light or through shape changes. Uh, I would ask uh, um, Benancio uh, to to go to the other website, uh, this quietude.it, uh, to show how the system works, and then I will go back to the experience of wearing this uh, kind of jewels. Uh, the, the system works in two uh, different ways. So just with uh, uh, continuous listening of sounds, so behaving in some way, or recognize specific sounds. 
So let, let, let's start with, uh, we need uh, the audio here, otherwise. Uh, can you raise the volume? Well, I don't see the, the, the sound, sorry. The biggest coast Okay. Is can you? Now? Yeah. Just in the, the very last part. Can you start it again so that I can explain how it works? Okay, so the, the system works in this way um, with continuous listening just to give uh, to the deaf person um, uh, the impression of the sound around the if the environment is noisy, for example, and then with the uh, recognition of specific sounds. So there is an app uh this is, um uh the, 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 that is part of the system through the app the person can record sounds of interest and whenever the sound happens uh the uh, the person can decide in which way this is notified so uh, with light with vibration with shape change uh the person can also set the intensity for example but from this video, it is clear that uh, there is a continuity in interaction. The system is always aware. And there is also the expression of the qualities of the sound. So may maybe you remember that, that there were three, uh, three modules. The first one, the one at the bottom, filtered the uh, low frequencies. The one in the middle, the medium frequencies, and the other one, the high frequencies. So this was also a way to play with sound and um, and to see the sound or to feel the sound. Uh, this system was uh, demonstrated uh, in very very big venues. The, uh, we we have just finished an, an exhibition in Germany at the Ulm Museum. There was an exhibition on, on the uh, posthuman, and Quietude was selected as one of the um, uh, good example uh, of um, uh, wearables of the future and uh, of prosthesis, let's say, of the future. And a lot of people said, ah, wow, this is my voice. So it's not about hearing, it's also about seeing the voice, it's feeling the voice and playing with the voice. And it was very interesting to see how the deaf uh, persons that we involved reacted to, to that kind of design. For example, a deaf man said, uh, well, but we would like to have a belt like this or an armband or a watch, uh, a smartwatch uh, to have this kind of notifications. So they started transforming and changing. And uh, but the aesthetics was really the issue there. And it was, as Marco said, not just the beauty in the appearance. So of course these are jewels, so they have to be beautiful. But the aesthetics was in interaction. So feeling the sound, experiencing the sound, experiences the quality of the sound. And also the idea that human centeredness is important. This is a design that was done from a cultural perspective, looking at deaf people as people at first, <laughs> and then as a, a cultural minority with their language, uh, with their with their own culture, so not as a people who lack something, who are who are 
impaired and therefore have to be normalized to be like the other ones. And, and I think this is a, a very important message. I work quite a lot with uh, people with different kinds of disabilities and we, uh, and the need for beauty. This is really a human right. And this uh, beauty in, in the appearance, but mostly beauty in interaction. So feeling in comfort, uh, feeling, uh, feeling good. Um, you know, just having fun. Uh, these are human rights and they are as important as, you know, the functionality that we develop. And you can reach this kind of sensi sensibility just observing people and working with people. Um, what we uh, always do when we start a new project uh, is uh, making with people and thinking through making, so prototyping with them, because through making, you come up with new ideas and you can also share making with people who have some kind of disability, uh, because they, of course, as all the other ones with other kind of abilities or disability, they are proud of what they design. And, and they can contribute, they can raise their voice in the design. And this is extremely, extremely important. So I would like to finish this talk that was prepared in completely different way, just uh, uh, reading a quote uh, that for me and for my work, for my research was really a kind of, uh, you know, um, no, a, a, a guide huh? in, in my work. This is a quote from Case Overbeke. Uh, Case was professor at the uh, Department of Industrial Design in Eindhoven. He was my mentor. Uh, he, he really changed uh, the way uh, I I do still do research. Um, case passed away in 2011, but uh, his uh, legacy is, is really with us, is still with us. And I want to read a, a quote from um, his inaugural lecture. Um, he wrote a booklet that you can uh, find online, and the title is uh, The Aesthetics of, of the Impossible. And uh, many of uh, the concept that I um, presented today are there, so I, I really invite you to, to, to read the, the book. And the quote is, uh, design is about people. It is about our lives, our hopes uh, and dreams, our loneliness and joy, our sense of beauty and justice, about the social and the good. It is about being in the world. And I think this is, these are the many facets of experience, um, and experience, uh, any experienced designers should really, uh, pay attention and, uh, to this, to this message and to, uh, have, uh, people, uh, at the really center and forefront of, um, his or her design activity. Thank you very much and sorry again for this uh, very adventure way of giving a talk. It was impressive. I wouldn't be at your place giving a talk uh, without uh, the support of slides. Uh, today, uh, slides are uh, cognitive extensions uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's almost incredible how uh, well, you delivered, uh, and uh, so I can imagine uh, how beautiful was the original uh, uh, presentation. But uh, of course, uh, there will be the possibility then of sharing uh, these uh, uh, with uh, with the students and with the faculty. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, very impressive. Um, now there is time for uh, uh, a discussion. Um, I would like uh, to uh, see if there are questions uh, from. Uh, from our audience. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to ask a, a question. 
because I'm also interested in social robotics uh, and the UX of social robotics. Uh, so I would like to start from, from there. Um, so despite all technology advances that, uh, that you also have described, um, I think you also recognize that current social robotics is still far from uh, the general abilities uh, we would like to see in a, in a, in a robot collaborator. So uh, um, effective collaboration stems also from uh, being and doing together, growing together. So for, from, from mutual understanding and learning uh, from uh, uh, the partner that uh, usually occurs over long period of times and through building shared experiences, right? So um, I think you, you pointed a bit during your discussion also to this uh, important requirement. So the introduction of effective robot collaborator hangs upon the development of, let's say, an intersubjective, intersubjective space uh, by the agents, so humans and machines. How much do you agree with the idea that uh, such an intersubjective space would be a requirement for shifting from a vision of robots as tools or processes to one where robots are kind of autonomous agents co-adapting uh, with us and sharing experiences with us, of course, uh, considering experience uh, a very difficult uh, uh, term when speaking about robots. Could you please elaborate uh, on my comment? Yeah, that, that's a, a, a difficult question. I think I've been working in the human-robot interaction for something like 15 years now. And um, so working with uh, several different robots uh, and uh, the uh, robot design and in designing interaction with robots is challenging because, because uh, I mean, differently from any other kind of artifact, uh, they are autonomous. So they can take decisions, they can move, they are embodied. And the point is that you have to, uh, to take into account a very subtle threshold, uh, because to be, uh, believable as uh, agents, they should look like uh, humans or animals or lifelike characters somehow. So, so that, that we, something that we recognize as an object to interact with as we would do with uh, another human being. But from the other side, when they are too similar to, um, to a human being, then you have this uncanny um, valley effect. Uh, 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 I'm sure you know the, the work from Masaito Mori, um, uh, the Ancanne Valley effect is the drop in the attention that people have when interacting with a robot, because if they look like a human being and then you start interacting, then you are very much attracted because uh, now you believe that it's very similar to you. But then, for example, when you start touching and you feel that it's cold or it's plastic or uh, it doesn't speak as you would expect, then there is this drop. This is called the Ancanne Valley. And the Ancanne Valley somehow increases when uh, together with the, um, the life likeness of the robot. So the more the robot resembles uh, a human being, the more you risk this drop in the in the attention. So it's very tricky uh, to um, to design this kind of uh, interactions. On the other side, I would say that uh, I think I was the, the first one who um, brought in in Italy, in Europe. I would say. A robot, uh, this uh, Paro, the sealed robot, you know, the one that uh, yeah. works with uh, uh, with uh, just uh, stroking and, and the interaction is very simple, it's purely emotional, um, it's very, very nice. So I have two of these robots in, in my lab 
And when I had visitors around, they spent so much time just stroking the robot, looking at the eyes. The robot doesn't do anything. But, you know, the emotional uh, link that you have with this robot, which is very cute, uh, uh, is able to learn something. So I... For example, I uh, I spent time just uh, training the robot in recognize my my voice calling, and, and the robot you know turns the, the head or uh, turns the 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 the, um, the eyes is toward the source of light. For example, this small, very subtle um, uh, kind of behavior. These are extremely important. We are very sensitive to subtleties. So it's not just going from A to B. We have to design how to go from A to B. For example, uh, trying to synchronize the movement, the pace of walking with the pace of walking of the, of the person. Or uh, trying to uh, experimenting with empathy, so looking in the same direction, turning the, the head whenever the person turns the head, so looking in the same di direction, having a joint perspective. And all this comes from psychology. And that's right. why it's important to, uh, to study psychology for an experienced designer because these are old studies coming from psychology and we should try the way of putting this stuff together and try to enrich as much as possible uh, the robot behaviors with subtleties. And the subtleties change everything. They transform the experience. And believe me, with this paro, um, I introduced Paro, it was, uh, I think, 2003 or 2004 in Italy, and I proposed to um, uh, Takanori Shibata, the, the engineer who designed this robot, to use it for the first time with um, uh, for therapeutic uh, purposes. So I used it with uh, people with Alzheimer's disease, uh, with uh, children with disabilities, and it worked so well because the interaction was just about subtleties, was about being nice, was about using the hands, uh, was about having cute interactions, and uh, and these all these uh, ways of interacting with this kind of technologies are not very much explored. But this is, again, uh, all about uh, experience design. Okay, Patrizia, so I... thank you. Okay, so then, uh, sorry, Andrea. Uh, no, no, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, Patrizia for this uh, very clear uh, answer. And I totally agree that the psychology is more than uh, needed uh, uh, to address this type of questions, and I think you made uh, a great example with Paro and uh, the intersubjective uh, uh, interactive space that uh, uh, is uh, is designed uh, with this tool uh, uh, as uh, a demonstration of your uh, argument. Thank you. Okay. So, Patricia, if this was uh, so something, uh, let's say, uh, impromptu, so something not prepared, I think this can become a new format. So, because it was so effective <laughs> to me, and I think our students really appreciate the, uh, the effort. So, uh, I'm always, uh, uh, let's say, impressed by the quality of your speech, but also the way you research. So, um, as you have uh, said before, uh, in your uh, let's say work and in your activities, uh, practice is uh, maybe prominent than research activity. So you test so much, interact with the user. So how this can be part of the journey of a professional and um, how to deal with these two questions? Because designers always dream and uh, psychologists uh, observe how to put together together this question throughout the prototyping, for example? I I would say just do it. When you have uh, when you have an idea, 
just be sure that the idea is actionable and just start prototyping it. And uh, try to reflect on what you do when you make. Because during making, you can come up with a lot of new ideas. And uh, it, it is clear that it is difficult uh, to work with, uh, with people, potential uh, future clients. It is difficult because it takes time, uh, but it's the only way. And so um, I think that uh, a clever way of doing this is also to work a lot within the, uh, the design team. The design team should be multidisciplinary. And so people can play different roles. Uh, but uh, it is important not to wait too much uh, before starting prototyping. Uh, you can prototype with very, very simple things. I'm fascinated about what the, 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 the stuff that we have at, at the Fab Lab, because the Fab Lab is really the place where you can do almost any, anything, uh, anything. And when you start prototyping and when your ideas are materialized, immediately you have a kind of experience uh, with these things. So don't wait, um, start trying stuff, uh, even within the, the design team. Uh, it's important. Uh, it's important to materialize the ideas and to make other people appropriate these ideas. And then you see what happens. And you don't have to fall in love with any of your ideas, because this is also another intention. Um, it's important to observe, to learn from others, to form a knowledge, a very solid knowledge. Otherwise, you do a lot of uh, uh, mistakes during the, the design. But even when it seems impossible to address people, to involve people, just do it, just prototype it, and, and test and uh, iterate um, with any kind of prototype you can produce. To me, this is really the, the, the only way of doing this. Yeah, this is this is evident from your approach, and uh, this is, uh, I think, a good a good indication for our students because one of the most relevant, uh, let's say, challenge that we have is put together so different aims and also way of working. So I think doing is something that can bring together these two aims. And also if you are not designer, you can test, you can try, and you have to be free to make and make some wrong things and also reflect on this. This openness that you were discussing to me is the most prominent value of the next generation because they have a lot of tools and technology and um, let's say you, you talked about Fab Lab. So unfortunately we have not Fab Lab to be used as master, but the next time maybe we can uh, think to a workshop in your Fab Lab in Santa Chiara for the next edition. So this can be a would okay. be very, very much welcome. Uh, and even if people uh, are interested in coming and visit us, uh, visit us, that would be very, very nice. So that's thing, something to, to okay. think about. Okay, it was excellent. So unexpected and uh, better than I expected. So thank you again. And if you thank you. Is a, is a, thank it's you, always Patricia. a pleasure, but also a, a new discover. <laughs> so thank you, really. New format. <laughs> yes, yes. a bit stressful as a format, but it's a new format indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so, good luck. Thank you again. Bye. Thank, thank you. you, Patricia. And thank you all of you. And uh, now it's, I think, is uh, lunch time. Thank you also, Mark. You were here, so sorry. Yeah. I was... Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. I welcome Gillian, that is here. Okay. Thank welcome, you, Gillian. Uh, Gillian. Okay. So maybe now is lunch time for the students and yep. uh, for the ones that are. Uh, following us, uh, we will have a, a let's say a private session with Gillian to test the connection and to see the presentation, and we will come back half past two for uh, let's say the the Gillian talk. Okay. Yep. Uh, thank you and thank you for this wonderful morning. Thank you guys. Have a good lunch. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you again. Bye bye. Okay. Okay. So meanwhile, hi Gillian. Hi Gillian. How are you? Ciao. Come stai?